Over the last few days, much ado has been made over a signal detected during observations at the park's radio telescope in Australia. Over the next few months, a mundane earthly explanation for the signal will very probably be found. But at the same time, the WOW signal was detected over 40 years ago and we still don't have an explanation. And no, it wasn't comets. That hypothesis did not hold up and the signal remains a mystery. This new signal is very different from the WOW signal in some ways, but maybe not in one particularly interesting way, more on that in a bit. But here's what we know, which is limited mostly to what was reported in the media. This story leaked, which is unfortunate, since the team that detected the signal were not finished with their analysis. It's certainly possible that had it not leaked and the team found an earthly explanation for the signal, we wouldn't have ever heard anything about it. It would have simply been an interesting case of interference at best. After all, SETI detects signals all the time, the vast majority of which are of obvious human origin and quickly get eliminated. In fact, they get so many signals that most signals get automatically eliminated by computer programs written to identify earthly interference before a human even sees it. The signal, however, made it through that process of elimination to an unusual degree. The signal appeared in data that was being collected on Proxima Centauri solar flares. It's a very active red dwarf, and the SETI data was being collected piggybacked on those observations. The signal was detected at a frequency of 982.002 MHz. This is where the first sticking point is, and also something odd. It's suspiciously close to an integer, enough that a slightly off oscillator in a transmitter might produce it. This would squarely point to a human origin for the signal. This is because that while an alien civilization would know of radio, they wouldn't know of our human devised systems of measurements like Hertz. That's based on seconds, and seconds are a human measurement, not a universal one. Aliens would have their own system, not in common with ours. So that stands as a major clue that this is Earth interference of some sort, but it's a peculiar type not seen before. But that doesn't quite knock the signal out of the running as far as a SETI candidate. It's merely a suspicious feature. On the other hand is the oddity. The radio spectrum is unbelievably vast, which means that a signal is a needle in a haystack. If you broadcast at any given frequency, someone else would have to by chance be tuned just to the right frequency to receive it. Granted, we can tune to a huge amount of frequencies all at once with modern equipment, but it's still an inherent issue. As a result, there are a number of frequencies that SETI tends to focus on that have some kind of signpost value, such as the infamous 1420 MHz hydrogen line the frequency at which hydrogen in the universe can emit radio. With the understanding that alien scientists doing radio astronomy and sending out signals would know of this as well. The oddity here is that the signal does come close to such a signpost. It's nearly, but not exactly, three times the frequency at which deuterium emits radio. But it's close enough that things like Doppler shifting might at least partially bring it closer to the target. But caution is warranted here. That may simply be a coincidence, and if it's found to be of earthly origin, which it probably is, then it doesn't mean anything. The signal bears several other interesting attributes. One is that it's narrowband, apparently very much so. This essentially eliminates nature as a cause. Nature's radio signals are almost always broadband. If you were listening to natural signals on a radio, you'd hear those signals smearing across multiple channels across the dial. Only in very rare cases does nature produce narrowband signals, but that is very limited and not really applicable to this signal. In this case, it's very likely technology producing it as opposed to nature. It's simply not clear whose technology it is. Another aspect of the signal is its drift. This is also weird. Normally signals that SETI picks up drift downward due to the motion of the planets of the transmitter and the receiver. This one drifts upward, and why that is is unclear but it would reveal details about the behavior of whatever is transmitting it. But weird drift in a SETI candidate has happened before, and indeed seems to be the norm for weird signals that might have been of alien origin. Case in point, in 2003, a signal was detected known as SHGB02 plus 14A through the efforts of the SETI at Home project. The signal was detected very close to the 1420 MHz hydrogen line signpost as indeed was the WOW signal, but in a different part of the sky. In this case, the area between the constellations Aries and Pisces. 
The signal was incredibly weak, in contrast to WOW which was incredibly strong, 30 times background noise, and unknown for the Proxima signal since the data on its strength isn't out there yet, though it's said in one media article to have been fairly weak. SHGB02 plus 14A was different from the WOW signal in that it was observed to repeat, which WOW so far never has been observed to do so, though none of these sources are watched anything close to 24-7. It's worth noting here though that with the resources SETI had, constant observation wasn't really on the table, there's just too much to look at. So even with a famous signal like WOW, in the four decades after the signal, you can count the total number of observation time of the area as a matter of only a few days. SHGB02 plus 14A was seen three times for a total of about one minute and was seen to drift very rapidly. This is weird. Either the signal was intentionally broadcast to drift like that or it was located on the surface of a very rapidly rotating planet, implausibly so, like 40 times faster than Earth rotates. Also strange is that the area of the sky where the signal originated doesn't have very many nearby stars, leaving the whole thing without a very good origin candidate. There are some red dwarfs, one of which is only about 14 light years from us, but none seem very good candidates to host an indigenous alien civilization, but neither does Proxima Centauri. SHGB02 plus 14A remains unexplained, with potential explanations ranging from a glitch in the equipment to an artifact of random chance. Its weakness and its failure to be observed repeating since, and the bizarre drift, all stand against it. At the same time, drift is overall a good thing. If you see a signal that has no drift, it's probably coming from a transmitter down the road here on Earth and not moving relative to you. That's assuming, of course, that the drift is due to motion. It's also possible that weird drift could have been intentionally broadcast that way, perhaps to get attention and the strange upward drift seen in the Proxima signal might have been sent that way intentionally, though it's a somewhat ambiguous way to inform anyone of artificiality given that there do seem to be ways to create this kind of drift naturally, dependent on the situation at the source. It's also unclear if the signal actually does originate from the Proxima Centauri system. All we know is that it simply comes from something in the area of the sky where that star is roughly a half the diameter of the moon patch of sky, and could also be a background object behind Proxima Centauri. But if it does originate from that system, it doesn't seem like it came from either of the two known planets in the system, such as Proxima b in the star's habitable zone. Rather, it would probably be in orbit of the star itself, or is in space moving slowly in our general direction, but not necessarily straight at us, which is unlikely. If the signal is intentionally being shifted by whoever is transmitting it, there is a strange parallel here. In fact, it's a little spooky. See, the WOW signal may have done something similar to this. One of the interesting features of the WOW signal was its frequency. It was near 1420 MHz, about where SHGB02 plus 14A was, but some distance from BLC1 on the dial, but not too far. The exact frequency that WOW was at has been difficult to pin down, though corrections were made for the various motions of the Earth, etc., that Doppler shift signals, and there are two calculations done by discoverers John Krauss and Jerry Eman that give different answers. One of these places it just slightly above the 1420 MHz hydrogen line, the other a bit further away. If the closer is the case, this could be blue shift, and the source was moving slightly towards us, and, oddly enough, later observations of the hydrogen clouds in space in the two areas where the signal is thought to have possibly originated are blue shifted at very nearly the same amount, which is very odd indeed. Or it could have been intentionally broadcast at that frequency at the source, there's no way to tell. But it may have been that the WOW signal also might have been drifting upward, like this new signal, though the observation window for WOW was much shorter, only 72 seconds over a single observation. So it's hard to say anything but maybe. Unless it repeats, there just isn't enough to go on. Yet another puzzling feature of the BLC1 signal, whether from Earth or aliens, is that there doesn't appear to be any modulation of the signal. In other words, it appears to be something like a tone and not a message. This was also the case with the WAS signal. This might mean that the telescope wasn't sensitive enough or equipped to pick up any modulation that might have been there, or it might just be something like a tone on the radio dial, though even that is a bit of a stretch. It's more just raw radio waves at a certain frequency. Humans do produce such things, but aliens might too. 
or it might simply be an artificial beacon shooting out a narrowband signal with no information just to announce that they are there. It's a simple message, but it does answer the other's are we alone question if they can confirm it. Another issue with BLC-1 is that it was not seen in real time, was not confirmed with a second telescope, and apparently hasn't been seen since. Part of the problem here is that the world's radio telescopes tend to be in the northern hemisphere, looking at the northern hemisphere's view of the sky. Proxima Centauri, however, is a southern hemisphere star, where there aren't a lot of radio telescopes equipped with the right equipment to take a look other than the Parkes telescope. This is changing, however, so future observations from multiple radio telescopes will be possible, should this source appear again. But what about the potential earthly explanations? Could it have been a plane? Aviation does use the frequency range of the signal, though otherwise this frequency range is relatively clear in comparison to others. Given that the observations were reportedly made over a period of three hours at the same location in the sky stands against aircraft, planes are not stationary in the sky. Could it have been a satellite? It's the same problem, they move. Though there are very specialized orbits that might allow a satellite to seem to hang there for a long enough period of time to account for it, but no such satellites that could be transmitting at this frequency are known. But spy satellites exist, and we don't always know much about them or their activities. And it pays to remember here that all we have to go on are a few interviews with some of the involved researchers in media articles done after the leak. So it's best to reserve judgment here until the actual papers on this signal come out over the next few months. Anyway, even still, a satellite origin of some sort does seem to be the most likely explanation here. Finally, could it have been a transmitter on Earth? Possibly. There was the famous story about the microwave oven in the break room at this very same telescope producing unexplained signals, but I suspect they have since bought a new microwave, shielded the old one, or now just ignore the signals when someone's having lunch. But the problem with an Earth-based transmitter is twofold. First is the drift. Signals fixed on the ground tend not to drift unless intentionally so, which opens up another possibility. It's also possible that someone decided to play a prank on the radio astronomers and came up with an elaborate hoaxed signal and shot it into the telescope. Just saying it's possible, but only marginally so, in this case. The second way to help eliminate ground interference is a method called nodding, which the researchers at Parks employed. You point your radio telescope at the source and see the signal, then you point it in some other direction and look for the signal there, and then repeat. This is useful for eliminating earthly origins for a signal, First, it tells you that the signal is actually there, and likely not a glitch in your receiver. It also helps eliminate ground sources, such as the microwave oven, because ground-based signals tend not to go away completely when you reorient the telescope. So could it be a plane, satellite, or ground source? Possibly, but none are particularly good fits here, which is why this signal made it through so many filters. And there is the question of modulation. When humans send signals, they tend to include information, this one appears to have none. And technologies and situations change, weird radio reflections and such happen, and it may be that this is some new type of human interference entirely. It probably is, or just some rare interference situation that simply wasn't immediately evident as to its nature. And once it's figured out, then SETI will know what to eliminate when they see a signal like this again. But it's also possible that the signal may never be picked up again and forever remain unexplained as the WOW signal did. That would be maddening, since in reality as more bits and pieces of information have been worked out about the WOW signal, it has only grown more mysterious, haunting, and interesting. That could happen with the signal as well. We may never know what it was, and the more we study the data, the more interesting it might get. But the final question here is what happens if it's picked up again and continues to pass all the tests? Verification. Scientists will want to get multiple observations of the signal and study it to try to eliminate all possibility of Earth interference. Then, they'll also try to think of new ways that nature might produce such a signal. This is very likely already going on inside the Breakthrough Listen team as they analyze what was going on here. And it's always possible, if unlikely, that it will continue to pass the tests. So what then? What if it is an alien signal? While it's highly unlikely to be the case, a signal of this type would change everything. Firstly, Proxima Centauri is literally currently the closest star to the Sun. That is not where one would expect to find a signal from an alien civilization, especially if alien civilizations were rare. 
Odds are, any signal of alien origin is going to be very distant, and if it is an alien civilization indigenous to Proxima Centauri, then it would suggest that there are an enormous amount of alien civilizations at any given time in the Milky Way. Millions. It would be worse than Star Trek, and no one would likely be able to remember the names of all the intelligent species that are out there. I forgot the name of your species is never a good way to start a polite conversation with an alien. The signal could also tell us life, and indeed intelligence, can arise in a system centered on a red dwarf, the most common type of star in the universe. This has been a subject of some debate lately, as doubt has been cast on red dwarfs being good stars for habitable planets. Their habitable zones lie quite close into the star, which would subject habitable planets to atmosphere-destroying flares. This is the case for Proxima Centauri. It's an active flare star, and the two known planets do not seem to be good candidates for hosting a civilization. The larger planet is frozen, and Proxima b, which is an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone, is blasted with flares and radiation. But this debate is still open, with certain types of planets not very much like Earth, but still possibly habitable by some kind of life holding better chances to stand up to a red dwarf. And as red dwarfs age, they tend to get calmer, so while they might not host indigenous life, they might make for interesting real estate to colonize. That would be disconcerting, however, since we'd literally be right next door to a highly advanced spacefaring colonizing alien empire. How far does the empire stretch, and is it still growing? After all, if it's life like ourselves, then Earth is a pretty attractive planet indeed. It's like searching the great desert of space, only to come across a delicious pineapple. On the other hand, if it's a machine civilization that has abandoned biology entirely, planets may not be all that useful other than for raw materials. And in that case, asteroids and moons are more economical since you don't have a huge gravity well to deal with when mining. Earth might avoid being consumed for raw materials, but goodbye moon. But the idea that at any given time we share the galaxy with millions of other civilizations is in itself a problem. If they all emit radio like Proxima Centauri, we'd have unambiguously seen them all over by now. It would be a galaxy of radio station planets where anywhere you turn your telescope, you'd see civilizations broadcasting away to the tune of millions constantly. We'd have more study candidates than we would know what to do with. Obviously, this is not what is seen. Instead, we see overwhelming silence, other than the scarce few candidates that, while interesting to be sure, they seem to not repeat. And that doesn't answer any questions. It only creates them. This calls into mind another obscure group of signals hidden in the history of SETI. Like the WOW signal, these were picked up by Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope, which incidentally no longer exists, and the land it was on is now a golf course. Known as bumps in the night, these strange signals were detected, thousands of them over the lifetime of the SETI experiment, at around 1420 MHz, and would last only about 10 seconds before they vanished. They came from all over, and never from the same place twice. That sounds like an instrument glitch, or interference, except that they clustered above and below the galactic plane and never appeared within it. What those non-repeating signals were remains a mystery. On the other hand, that's a matter of statistics, and sometimes situations can defy such expectations. We ourselves, as a civilization, are unlikely to be here, yet here we are. So in this case, the location of Proxima Centauri for an alien transmitter could be something situational, such as an alien civilization realizing that there was an inhabited world here, and then stationing a transmitter nearby, the nature of which we'd understand as soon as we became capable of radio. Radio might be primitive to them, but it might still be useful when wishing to communicate with primitives like us. After all, if civilizations are very rare in the galaxy, as the Great Silence suggests, then even a highly advanced civilization might take interest in any kind of intelligent life it finds, even if primitive by their standards. And it might make more sense if you want to communicate with an up-and-coming civilization to not station a transmitter directly in their star system. That might scare them. Instead, putting it in the next star system over might seem more friendly, though even still it does seem a bit close. But the problem here is that stars move, and we just happen to be close to Proxima Centauri right now, 
if that's indeed the origin of the signal. In the past, we weren't close, and in the future, we won't be again. They would have had to know when they would be communicating with us, which would imply a more recent time of origin for the transmitter, if indeed it was intended for us at all. It's always possible that aliens might not care that we're here, or just ignore us, and the signal's purpose was something internal to their civilization, such as something like a navigation beacon. And some have argued that advanced alien civilizations wouldn't use radio at all, and would use some other form of highly advanced communication. Thus, any radio signal that looks technological must have a human origin. The problem with that is that we have no idea what an advanced alien civilization would or would not do. After all, we still use fire extensively, despite it being as ancient of a practice as it can get. It's also possible, though beyond unlikely, that an indigenous alien civilization at Proxima Centauri might be at about the same level of technology as us. This would be spooky. The two civilizations would just happen to be right next to each other, and happen to be at the same level of technology at exactly the same time is almost impossible. After all, our own technology could have advanced faster in the past than it actually did, such as the knowledge of the steam engine, which goes back to Heron of Alexandria and the Greco-Roman period, but was never actually put to work. Had it, the Roman Empire might have included the moon. So if it were found that a civilization was at about our level of technology, we'd be forced to ask ourselves why that is, and the aliens might be asking themselves the same question. Did someone or something interfere with both civilizations in the past? This would also open up the sci-fi speculative possibility that whatever sent the signal might also be human, or clearly some form of life related to Earth that was transported at some point to the Proxima Centauri system. That would be the ultimate and interesting new forms of human interference, if it was a signal sent by a human in another star system. That would also be a very awkward first contact to say the least. Are you human? No, we're your cousins, the laser beam octopus people, and we're coming home. Attempts at humor aside, it's worth noting here that if you want to set up communications with other civilizations, putting transmitters into star systems close to known habitable worlds might make a lot more sense than huge energy hungry beacons. It might not make sense to put such a thing directly in the recipient's solar system as not to scare them, but light years away at a comfortable distance to form a relay system not unlike how our own cell phone systems work, in this case 4.2 light years away, though even that seems kind of scary close. In fact, so close that if this is an intelligent alien signal, we might be able to see the source directly fairly soon. This is because of Breakthrough Starshot, the idea of setting up miniature probes connected to laser-driven light sails and sending them to explore Proxima Centauri. This could conceivably allow us to photograph the transmitter directly. If this is an alien signal, you can bet that project would be kicked into overdrive, and it might well happen within a lot of our lifetimes. And if by some means it chose to communicate with us using radio signals, 4.2 years each way is not that long of a time to wait for communications. We could send a message and get a response back inside of a decade. Decoding it would be another matter entirely though, that may never be possible. But it's interesting to note that unlike most scenarios where communications might take centuries, that is not the case here. And if there is an alien civilization at Proxima Centauri, they can pick up our radio, especially our radar. They very probably know about us. But in any case, it's very, very unlikely that the signal is of alien origin. It's almost certainly just some odd earthly interference. The chances here are minuscule, but one day, who knows? So stay tuned for more updates as more comes out on the Proxima Centauri signal. But I leave you with this. If this mystery remains unsolved from here on out, should we respond to the signal, perhaps with an identical signal of our own, in other words, an exchange of dial tones of sorts? Or should we do everything we can to stay quiet? Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently leaking information. Yes, over at Event Horizon, I'm the leaky boat. This coming week in a multi-part interview, I will be joined by Dr. Avi Loeb again, where we discuss this signal, but also the possibility that the simplest explanation for the bizarre attributes of the interstellar object Oumuamua is that it was a piece of defunct alien technology. I'd normally condemn alien littering in our star system, 
but that would be some interesting trash to look through indeed. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer, and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.